Welcome to the first annual Sean McEwan commemoration, which takes place on the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Balnali, where the Irish forces defeated the Black and Tans who came to our village. We had a number of events planned, however, due to COVID-19 restrictions, we've had to cancel most events. However, we are hosting a number of online events, including a historic talk on the Battle of Balnali, a reading of McEwan's speech from the dock, and I'm delighted to say, on Tarnish to Leo Varadkar, we give a narration from Dublin. For those not familiar with the story of Sean McEwan, he was a native of the North Longford village of Balnali, where I am now standing. He was a leading member of the Irish Volunteers during the War of Independence and played a pivotal role in many engagements throughout the Midlands. He would go on to command the famous North Longford Flying Column. He was wounded, captured, sentenced to death in 1921, which was commuted following the truce between Republican and Crown forces. While in jail, he successfully contested the 1921 general election and was elected to the second Dáil. Following the War of Independence and Civil War, he would steadily rise through the ranks of the Irish Army, becoming Chief of Staff in 1929. He had a long and distinguished career as a Fine Gael TD, serving as Minister for Defence and Justice in the inter-party governments of the 1940s and 50s, before retiring for politics in 1965. He remains a great source of pride for the people of Longford, and I'm absolutely delighted to launch the first annual Sean McEwan Commemoration, an event which I hope will happen for many years and decades to come. I hope you enjoy the commemoration. Throughout 1920, the North Longford Volunteers had waged a successful campaign against the RIC, conducting attacks on barracks and raiding for arms. In the latter part of 1920, the nature of the War of Independence had changed. The introduction of the Black and Tans in March of that year and the auxiliaries in June to bolster the ranks of the RIC led to assassinations, reprisals and counter reprisals becoming commonplace. In Longford, the assassination of District Inspector Kelleher in the Greville Arms Hotel in Granard on October 31st and the shooting of Constable Cooney at Brahe near Banali on the following day were to set in train a series of events that were to catapult North Longford and the village of Banali into the national headlines. Sean McKeown is OC of the 1st Battalion as well as organiser for County Longford since Sean Connolly's move to GHQ staff, now placed the North Longford Flying Column on full-time service. Fearing the inevitable reprisal by the Crown forces, he put plans in motion for both Granard and Banali. Placing Sean Murphy in charge in Granard, he split his column between both locations, while he himself concentrated on the defence of his native Banali. Mobilising all men he could from the 1st Battalion area, that included Clumbrony, Cullumkill and Killow, he had a force of approximately 40 men at his disposal. Unsure as to which direction the Crown forces may approach the village, he deployed a party at each of the approaches. Michael Francis Reynolds and men of the Colo Company at Doherty's Cross on the Longford approach. He had approximately 15 men armed mostly with shotguns and just three service rifles. Hugh Hurrican, OC of the Lebroni Company of the 1st Battalion, was in command of approximately nine men based at the Protestant Church covering the Edgestown approach. Sean Duffy, adjutant of the 1st Battalion, was based at the old schoolhouse on the Granard Road with approximately four to five men. Frank Davis, quartermaster of the 1st Battalion, commanded a party of three men located at Herities on the Banlamuk side of the village. Sean McKeown was based in the centre of the village at Rose Cottage with a force of four men, including his younger brother Seamus, Thomas Early, Seamus Conway and Sean Sexton. On the evening of November the 3rd, Ballinalee residents gathered in the local church for a novena, where the parish priest, Father Monford, encouraged all to vacate the village. With the exception of PJ Herity, sub postmistress Miss Kiernan and Patrick Murta and their families all left the village. Assembling his men in the churchyard, Father Mumford gave the small defending force general absolution before they took up their assigned positions. The time now was approximately 8 pm and it had started to rain heavily on what was described as a bleak dark night, visibility being only 20 to 30 yards. At midnight, McKeown received a dispatch from Hearts that Granard was on fire. A large convoy of RIC, black and tans, complemented by the detachment of night lancers, descended on the town and burned many houses and businesses there. At approximately 2 a.m. on the morning of the 4th of November, the lights of a mill convoy could be seen approaching the small village. Stopping initially at McKeown's Forge at Kilsruley, they broke in, but on this occasion did not set it alight. Proceeding into Banali, the convoy wheeled right towards Achna Cliff. The first lorry pulled up at Hurleties, while others filed behind. The last lorry stopped momentarily on the Granard Road, 
with its headlights trained towards McKeown's position at Rose Cottage, before taking its place behind the rest of the convoy. Sean McKeown then took a small party of men out onto the centre of the road at the crossroads, lying down some 20 yards to the rear of the last lorry. In the darkness, the rattle of petrol tins could be heard as the Crown forces dismounted. McKeown then called out in the darkness for the enemy to surrender, which was flatly refused, and simultaneous fire was opened up. Seamus Conway made his way down in the darkness along the cortege and when halfway down launched two Mills bombs into the centre of the parked lorries. Confused and sporadic fire continued for approximately five minutes. The Crown forces opened up with Vickers and Lewis machine guns and shot widely. The small defending party had come under heavy machine gun fire for the first time in their lives. The camber of the hill affording the only cover as bullets rained over their heads while others fell short kicking gravel up into their faces. Each of the IRA were armed with service rifles and began the fight with 80 to 100 rounds per man. As the fight endured, the small detachment had to conserve their ammunition and could only fire at the flashes of light emanating from the barrels of enemy guns. The IRA parties on the other roads failed to join the fight. McKeown dispatched Thomas Early to the Protestant church to bring down Hugh Howrick and his party. However, they never arrived. Intermittent fire continued over a period estimated at being two hours. At one point, the men sensed a movement in the plantation to the rear of Rose Cottage. McKeown sent his brother Seamus and Sean Sexton down the Lanford Road and, taking a laneway on their right, fired into the dense shrubbery, adjusting their position each time to discharge their weapons to give the impression of a larger force. They could hear the sound of the enemy scurrying a retreat through the undergrowth. Returning to the crossroads, they were relieved to see McKeown and Conway still holding the hill. In the absence of reinforcement parties closing in, McKeown and his men were now in a perilous position, where they were down to just a handful of rounds. However, luck was on their side, and they noticed a decrease in the enemy fire, and the Crown forces began to mount their lorries, and one by one, drove slowly off in the direction of Badenamuk, taking the Sordon Road. The Rose Cottage detachment stayed in position until daylight dawned to reveal the littered street left in the wake of the offensive. Items and commodities which had been looted from Granard. Also, in their haste to leave, the enemy party had left ammunition. It was observed also that there were pools of blood. However, there were no dead bodies. The element of surprise, allied with the dark and wet conditions, had undoubtedly assisted the IRA in a successful defence of Banali but it would also appear to have assisted a state of confusion on both sides. McKeown and his party did not receive any assistance from the outlying parties. Frank Davis and his party, based at Herities, had to withdraw as their position had been overrun by a large convoy and they found themselves surrounded. The defence of Banda was now making national headlines. McKeown moved his headquarters to Kiernas of Dromil, from where he drafted new plans for the defence of the village. All available men from the 1st, 5th and 6th battalions of North Longford were now drafted in, fearing a return of even greater numbers of Crown forces. Sean Connolly arrived from Roscommon, bringing in attachments of troops from there. Connolly had disobeyed orders from headquarters in doing so, and arrived on the morning of the 5th of November. It is estimated that over 300 troops now occupied Banali for a period of three weeks. Upon questioning from journalists, Neither the RIC or military authorities took any responsibility for the sacking of Granard, and reports appearing in newspapers in the days after the battle would appear to greatly inflate the casualties. One article estimated the dead on the British side as high as 17. It was never officially stated, however, with the assistance of contemporary records available today, it would appear there were no British fatalities. The Battle of Bandon Lee on the 4th of November 1920 has had as many versions as it has reporters. What is not in doubt is that a combined force of RIC, Black and Tans and military estimated somewhere in the region of 70 to 110 entered Banali intent on burning the village and were forced to withdraw and abandon their plans of destruction by the actions of the IRA. McKeown and his four young comrades stood firm against a vastly more experienced, well-equipped and superior force. The application of effective guerrilla-style warfare had yielded more of an impact than its numbers and resources merited. The Crown forces, perhaps seeing no defence mounted in Granard, had erroneously thought that the same would be true of Banla Lee. The defenders of Banla Lee that night were all members of Plumbroni Company of the Irish Volunteers and were born and raised in the parish. 
Sean and Seamus McKeown were from Kilsruley, Thomas Early from Banalee Village, Seamus Conway from Lissamine, and Sean Sexton from Kiltatla. Banalee was safe for now, and the Battle of Banalee will live long in the memory, gaining notoriety as the only village or town to successfully repel an attack by Crown forces during the War of Independence. Officers and gentlemen of the court martial, when you opened the proceedings here this morning, I told you I was an officer of the Irish Republican Army, and I claimed treatment as an officer. But gentlemen, you are not here to treat me, nor as an officer, but as a murderer. Why? Just because I took up arms in defence of my native land. Defence of one's native land has always been a privilege to the people of the nation and of all nations have, de have demanded the service of their sons as a right. Be sure that the principle, which is, is a proper principle, for the Yugoslavs, for the Czechoslovakians, for the Belgians and the Siberians, is equally a proper, proper principle for the Irish. I took my stand on that principle. The stand has been fully approved by the people of Ireland, and I am glad to feel that, I, that in carrying out my duty to my country I have Act, all has acted in accordance with the usage of war, which was committed by me and by my officers and men under my command, can stand any test judgment by any tr impartial tribunal. All, pris all prisoners who fell, fell into my hands were treated in a fair way. Wounded were treated to the best of my ability. Some of these prisoners will be called here today to prove this. They will be called not in order that my punishment which you, in, you intend to bestow upon me should be mitigated, but just to show that my words are true. Contrast their treatment with the treatment I received in Mullingar when handcuffed, bleeding with from a bullet wound which was thought to be fatal, and I lying on the ground where I had fallen. I was beaten with the rifle butts of the enemy, enemy forces in the dear room of the barracks, beaten in the, beaten in the face and roughly handled, called names, Revolvers pushed into my side, and these men said that there was nothing said or done to me. Oh no, but without reason I tell them, by the way, what they considered essential for my conviction, I leave it to you cells to consider. The hub, the, the hub there had been when they knew, as they pleased to call me, McKeown the murderer was in. It, it, is, it is sworn that at, it, I was at Clonfin. I did not allow the wounded to be ill-treated. The witnesses will make it clear that there was no desire on the part of any of my men to ill-treat any prisoner, the wounded or unwounded. Let me make one remark at the present, in, on the present case. You are trying me for the murder of Mr McGrath, DI, of the RIC. What happened on that occasion, the 7th of January 1921, was this. I was in a small house and was surrounded by the enemy forces who had advanced without my knowledge. There were two old ladies in the house, and I could not defend myself there, but rushed out to meet my enemies. The odds were heavily stacked, stacked against me. The DJ had his revolver at the present. The police officers with their rifles on the ready. Fire was opened by both sides, simultaneously. After the first exchange, I noticed that the officer had fallen, and that his men were running down the road. It must be emphasised the high fired at the enemy forces, and as, as it appeared before me, not any one individual in particular. Well, Sergeant Ryan swears he fired at me. Sergeant Clement swears he fired on me. Consulant Gilbert swears he fired at me. The, officers, the officer was between these men and myself, and it would be just as reasonable to suppose he was killed by them as by me. He, he simply fell, to the, fell in the fight. I might as easily have been any other member of his force. It might much more easily have been myself, in view of the manner in which I was outnumbered. It has been sworn that I made certain statements in Mullingar. Well, I don't know whether I did or not, but one statement I did make, and I now repeat it, is that James J. Devine Corrigatean Banley was wrongly convicted in accordance with English law. And I said at Mullingar, in that witness, 
in that the witnesses who were swearing against the vine were brought into my presence. They would see that I was the man, not the vine. And yet he is serving a long term of imprisonment for something which he certainly did not do, but I certainly did. I wish to say finally that I, finally, that I am not guilty of any foul offence or murder. The people of Longford who have made me their representative know that. The people of Ireland who have made so many of my fellow officers their representatives know that. And I take this opportunity to thank the people of Longford for their confidence in me. That confidence is my justification and it is my loyalty to the men who have fought by my side. I, liked, I take this opportunity to refer to the paying tribute to the gallantry and the loyalty of the men who have fought by my side. They stood up to superior numbers and superior equipment, and every time they, feet, they beat the foe. From you gentlemen, I crave, I crave no favours. I am an officer of the Irish Army and merely claim the right at your hands. What you would receive at mine had the fortunes of war reversed the position. If you don't give me that right, but execute me instead, then my last request is that you give, me, give my dead body to my relatives so that my remains may be laid to rest among my own people in Longford. Long live the Republic. Good afternoon. It's my great honour to give the oration at the first annual Sean McKeown commemoration. There's nowhere I'd rather be today than the beautiful North Longford village of Balnalee, but unfortunately that's not possible because of the pandemic. As you know, Balnalee is central to the story of Sean McKeown, not just because he was born and lived most of his life there, but because a hundred years ago this week, Sean McKeown led a small group of 40 volunteers in a 12 hour battle against over a hundred black and tans and successfully repelled their attack, preventing them from burning and looting the town. Earlier we heard from local historian Barney Sexton about how the battle played out in the early hours of November 3rd, 1920. What may be less understood, however, is the impact the battle had on the wider conflict and indeed the fight for Irish freedom. The War of Independence is usually divided into two separate categories, the Intelligence War in Dublin and the Guerrilla War in the countryside. However, there were at least three what could be described as the large-scale engagements during the conflict. Balnalee was the first such engagement, the other two being Crossbury in Cork and Customs House in Dublin. News of the successful defence of Balnalee would spread throughout the country and would inspire volunteers in other counties. The Irish people, who had grown weary of regular news of towns and villages being burned, were stirred by the news and were greatly encouraged to know that there are brave men and women capable of standing up to the appalling aggression of the Black and Tans. Of course, the Longford Volunteers and the famous North Longford Flying Column had many other engagements during this period at Arva, Edwardstown, Drumlish and Granard, but perhaps the best known occurred at Clonfin. I think it genuinely cannot be under, understated how important Clonfin and subsequent events were to the trajectory of the War of Independence, the truce and the treaty negotiations. On the 5th of February 1921, Sean McKeown led the North, North Long, Longford Flying Column in a highly coordinated ambush of auxiliaries three miles from Balnalee. The successful ambush led to the deaths of four auxiliaries and the capture of the remaining 17, at least half of whom were wounded. Their wounds were treated and the prisoners were subsequently released unharmed. The humane treatment by McKeown of his prisoners would not go unnoticed. The following month, McKeown would find his fortunes reversed. While returning from a meeting with GHQ in Dublin, he was captured at Mullingar train station following a shootout at which he was seriously wounded in the chest. McKeown would be the subject of many subsequent beatings and mistreatments, which culminated in a murder trial in which he would be sentenced to death. The contrast could not be more stark, and this was picked upon by the national, international press and all well-meaning people, that there was an integrity and justice the Irish cause that was not matched on the British side. McKeown's eloquent speech from the dock, which we heard earlier from his nephew Sean, demonstrated this with astonishing clarity of purpose. The British position was further undermined in June when McKeown was elected as TD for Longford West Mead in the second doll. When the truce was declared in July, McKeown's death sentence was commuted. But that was not enough for the people of Longford-Westmeath, and for Michael Collins in particular, who insisted that McKeown's release 
be a precondition of any negotiations between the British and Irish governments. The British relented in August. The blacksmith of Van Lee was released. The role that the volunteers of North Longford played during this time was immense. It's rightly a source of great pride for the people in the area today, many of whom are descendants of those brave volunteers. And as leader of Fine Gael, I share that pride. We're living in political times that are highly charged and there are people who wish to deny and denigrate the role that many Fine Gael people played during the revolutionary era. Some are names well documented by history, such as McKeown himself, Richard Mulcahy, Fiona Lynch and W.T. Cosgrave. Others are less well known, but nothing will ever diminish the pride we in the Fine Gael family feel towards the patriotic men and women who fought for our independence and to establish the state. Sean McKeown's reputation for chivalry followed him into the difficult days of the Civil War. In a conflict in which both sides did not always obey the rules of war, the same could not be said of General McKeown. The late Longford historian Padraig O'Farrell described it in simple and perfect terms when he said McKeown had many opposed him, but none who despised him. At the young age of 30, he achieved so much for his country and he was only getting started. Following the Civil War, he would rise steadily through the ranks of the Irish Army before becoming Chief of Staff in 1929. A long political career followed, in which he would serve 36 years in Dáil Éireann. His early years in the Dáil were a bleak time for the country. The economic war of the 1930s, followed by the outbreak of the Second World War, meant that Ireland had little chance of escaping recession during those years. A long spell in opposition finally came to an end in 1948, with the formation of the inter-party governments. McKeown was served twice in these governments, as Defence Minister and Justice Minister. The inter-party governments were among the most fascinating in the history of the state. It consisted of an unlikely coalition of Fine Gael, the Labour Party, Clan Apobatha, Clan Atalwyn, the National Labour Party and Independents. It contained Conservatives and Socialists, Free Staters and Republicans. But it worked and demonstrated what I believe is a lesson for all politicians today, that people who have opposing views can work together for the betterment of their country. Two achievements of the inter-party governments that particularly pleased McKeown were the Declaration of the Republic in 1949 and Ireland's entry to the United Nations in 1955. He was an internationalist who viewed Ireland taking its place among the nations of the world as a vital step in our national story. He also viewed it as a vindication of the stepping stone approach that was advocated by his great friend and comrade, Michael Collins, all those years previously. McKeown's commitment to the welfare of the nation as a whole and his symbol as a national figure was why he was deemed such a suitable candidate to contest two presidential elections on behalf of Fine Gael in 1945 and 1959. On both occasions he fell short to Fianna Fáil, Sean T. O'Calley and Eamon de Valera. Of course, McKeown was far from perfect. To quote Ted Kennedy at his brother Robert's funeral, he need not be idolised beyond beyond in death, what he was in life. A rational and non-partisan analysis of McKeown's political career must concede that he had views that were highly conservative and would in fact be totally unacceptable in the 21st century liberal democracy we have today. The first party inter-party government collapsed on the issue of the mother and child scheme. And while McKeown did not initially oppose it, it was clear he was reluctant to go against the church's teachings on social issues. The failure of politicians to confront the church's teachings on a number of issues caused many of the societal problems that cast a long shadow, which we're still dealing with today. But nobody could ever question McKeown's patriotism or his love of country, and it's long past time that his immense role in development of the state and its fight for independence is appropriately recognised. Of course, politics being politics, I'm aware that some will argue that to commemorate a man who took up arms against the crown while opposing subsequent violent campaigns, is hypocrisy on our part. It is true that Fine Gael had its roots in the campaigns of the revolutionary era, yet we remain steadfast in our opposition to violence, particularly in the context of the sectarian divide in the north of our country. I do not see any hypocrisy in this. In fact, I see consistency, a consistency that always succumbs to the democratic will of the people. The Enniskillen, Shankill and Omagh bombs, to name but a few, were despicable acts of terror 
committed by organisations that have no right whatsoever to claim to act on behalf of the Irish people. As recently as last year, I attended the funeral of a wonderful young woman, Lyra McKee, who was brutally murdered by so-called Republicans. We will never stop commemorating those who fought for Irish freedom, and we will never stop confronting those who would abuse and manipulate our history to promote terrorism, extreme nationalism or sectarianism. True patriots stand by the flag. They don't wrap themselves in it. Perhaps this was best described at McKeown's funeral in July 1973 by the Bishop of Arda and Clamac Noyce, Carl Daly. And I quote, After 50 years, there is still much unfinished business to do in Ireland, but the weapons of its completion are no longer rifles and grenades. Violence is not only irrelevant to the Irish nation's august destiny in 1973, it puts in grave peril all that has been achieved already and sets back by decades, perhaps generations, the hopes that remain still to be fulfilled. The tools of Irish patriotism now are not the drill of war, but the politics of economics and social justice. So today, at the first annual Sean McKeown commemoration, we have barely scratched the surface. There is so much more to explore about the life of the famous blacksmith. His friendship with Michael Collins, his beloved wife Alice Cooney, his attempted escape from Mountjoy Prison, his role in the Civil War, the presidential elections, and much, much more. As the nation battles the coronavirus, we must make sacrifices. But like all battles, it will come to an end. And the next Sean McKeown commemoration will hopefully take place in much happier times, surrounded by friends and neighbours in the beautiful and very special Longford village of Balmalee. Thank you very much.